Okay, we've taken uh, a lot of stuff off, left some things on here. We've got a little space here we can work with now. So now what we're going to do is we're going to redo pretty much what we did before, but I'm going to skip a lot of steps. Um, we're going to develop the second degree. Let's, let's take this off of here actually for the moment. Right now we have the first degree Taylor polynomial to approximate a function from R n to R. Well, the analog of what we had, but first of all, let's just note that since now everything is in R n, this is still a real number because the values of these things, the value of the function, the value of the approximating function, is a real number. Tar target space is R. So this is, uh, this is in R. But what about these? This is now in Rn. And that's then in Rn also. In fact, let's write those down. This is going to be, again, f of x bar. That's a naught. And this is going to be the gradient of f at x bar, the vector of uh, partial derivatives of f with respect to x evaluated at x bar, just like what we did when we evaluated um, the real function of one variable. Uh, we evaluated the first derivative at x bar. This is dot product with the vector delta x. And then we're going to have, that's a dot product, not i there. And then we're going to have the quadratic term. Well, what's the quadratic term going to be? Let's, uh, for now, let's just note that that's going to be a quadratic term in delta x. And so we'll add that down here. And so that's our second degree Taylor polynomial. But we want to know what this quadratic term here is going to be, and it's actually going to be delta x a delta x. Well, what do I mean by that? This and this are in Rn. The dot product is a real number, so a real number and a real number, and this is going to be a real number as well, but notice that this is in Rn, and this is in Rn. So this is going to have to be an n by n matrix. So that is n by n. And this is, just as before, this is the pure quadratic term, the homogeneous, if you like, quadratic term. So Let's uh, look at uh, what that quadratic term looks like. So let's go down here. We have a little space here that we might want to use. And let's actually write out just the quadratic term. The quadratic term is delta x a delta x. That is going to be um, delta x 1 delta x2 a, uh, here I have delta x1, and I'm writing it as a column vector, and this is n by n, and let's say this is where a is a matrix, a11, a12, a21, and a22, so if I write this out in detail, this is a11 delta x1 delta x1 plus a12 delta x1 delta x2 plus a21 delta x2 delta x1 plus uh, a22 delta x2 squared, delta x2, delta x2. And so that is 
our quadratic term in the case n equals 2. So let me emphasize that from here on down, this is all, of course, the case n equals 2. And if I had n equals 3, I would have a 3 by 3 matrix. This would be a 3 uh, dimensional vector and a three-dimensional vector, three by three matrix, and I would have not four terms, but nine terms here. Each term would be a pure quadratic uh, expression. It would be delta x1, delta x1, or delta x1, delta x3. I would have nine terms. I'm not going to write them all out, although when we get to looking at this in some detail shortly, we will actually write out the third degree um, quadratic, pure quadratic term. So uh, this is what we have for our quadratic term. Let me emphasize that these lowercase a's are just the elements of this matrix. They're not related to the a naught or the a1 up here. And of course, the matrix is, uh, let's write it as aij like this, knowing that it's 2 by 2 or n by n in general. So in general, n by n. And the ij term, of course, is going to be the second derivative of f with respect to xi and xj. And of course, also has to be evaluated at x bar. So now we have the analog in our n of our approximating Taylor polynomial, our second degree Taylor polynomial, um, the analog of what we had when n was 1, when we just had a real function. And so the, we can compare it by saying it, the constant term, the zero order term, is the value of f at x bar, same as in the one-dimensional case. The linear term is a pure linear function where this is an n vector and this is the n vector which is the gradient, the vector of partial derivatives, and that's what we have here. And where the pure quadratic term is uh, a function where every one of the terms in the sum is a quadratic term. That is, it's the product of two of the variables, delta x1, delta x1, delta x2, delta x1, and so on. And, uh, and the matrix is the matrix of second partial derivatives. So uh, one more thing that I want to do over here before we go back to maximization and minimization, go back to the importance of this for optimization, and that is to point out that, of course, um, while we haven't done very much in here yet with uh, second uh, derivatives, it is the case that the, uh, the second derivatives of the function with respect to xi, and oh, and by the way, this should have been xj down here, uh, they're symmetric. So the derivative with respect to xi and xj is the same as the derivative with respect to xi and then x, xj and then xi. Uh, so this is a symmetric matrix. So let's actually note that here. Let me use a different color here. So this is symmetric. And uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that um, we could write, uh, we could consolidate the two middle terms here because notice that delta x1 times delta x2 is the same as delta x2 times delta x1. So what I really have, if I put these two middle terms together, is a12 plus a21 times delta x1 delta x2. Um, and we'll come back and that will be a useful point uh, going forward. But for right now, I want to keep the, these terms distinct um, 
so that we actually have four separate terms when we have n equals 2. We have nine terms with a 3 by 3 matrix when n equals 3, recognizing that it's symmetric. So since it's symmetric, by the way, notice that a12 equals a21. So I could even rewrite this as 2 times either one of those, times delta x1, delta x2. But again, I want to keep this in this kind of written out extensively form because that's more useful for kind of seeing what's going on, for applying it, and so on. Last, before we go over to maximization and minimization again, let's note that uh, this kind of a function, a pure quadratic function, where all we have is the second degree quadratic terms, there's always a product of a delta x1 and another, a delta xi and a delta xj, that is uh, a function in its own right of delta x, and that's what we call a quadratic form. So let's actually write that here. This is what we call a quadratic form, a function, a purely quadratic function, only second degree terms um, with a symmetric matrix. So we want to have our matrix symmetric for the definition of being a quadratic form. And that's where we're going to go next. So after we finish with the lecture here, uh, our next lecture is going to be about quadratic forms. And to some extent, the lecture here today provides a kind of a background or foundation or motivation for why we're going to study quadratic forms. Because if we come back over here now, you'll notice in the case when n was 1, the question whether we had a maximum or a minimum of f at x bar turned out really to be whether the approximating uh, polynomials quadratic term was always positive, a2 positive, f double prime of x bar positive, or the pure quadratic term q of delta x was always negative because a2 is negative. This term is, of course, uh, always positive if delta x not, is not, the, uh, not zero. And so the pure quadratic term was all that was left in our approximating function in the case where we were at a maximum or minimum so that the first derivative was zero. So what about over here when we're in Rn? Well, in Rn, it's going to be the case that if x bar is a maximum or a minimum, this is the zero vector. All of the partial derivatives of f with respect to x, the various x's, at x bar will be zero. And in fact, let's even write down over here that the gradient of f is the uh, vector of partial derivatives And here, it's the partial derivatives, each one evaluated at the point x bar. So those partial derivatives are all 0. That's the 0 vector if we have a maximum or a minimum at x bar. So I need to change this from f prime, the derivative, which is a just one uh, number, I need to change this, and maybe I will use uh, this color to do this. I think we have to squeeze this in here. This is the gradient of f of x bar will be the zero vector if we have a maximum or a minimum. So these pictures here, they're not quite the right diagrams or the right pictures when we go to R2 or n bigger than 2, but they're basically the same idea. The domain is down here, and the change in the value of the function is here. And so in the case of n equals 2, of course, we would have a con uh, 
vex function as our approximation, the pure quadratic term would be a convex function, and here it would be a concave function. And of course, that's not, this is not going to be the, 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 the quadratic term because the quadratic term has now changed because we're in Rn. This quadratic term is now going to be, well, this is the quadratic term in the one variable case. So this is Q of delta x. This is the right Q of delta x when n is 1. But now we know that this is delta x a delta x when we're in Rn instead of that. And this is also corresponds to this down here. The pure quadratic term is delta x times an n by n matrix times delta x. So it's again the case that if we have a maximum, then um, we're in a picture that looks like this. And it's got to be the case that the Quad, the quadratic term, and let's even write that down here, the the quadratic term in our uh, approximating Taylor polynomial, that, uh, that quadratic term has to always be negative or at least zero. It can't be ever positive for any delta x. It's got to be, it's got to be negative. Um, and if x bar is a minimum of f, things have to look like this with a larger dimensional domain. It's got to be the case that the quadratic form is always positive or possibly zero. And indeed, if we do know that the gradient is the zero vector, and we know that the quadratic term is strictly positive, for any delta x that's not the origin, not the zero vector, then we actually can say that uh, this is a minimum. That is, we really do have something that looks like this. And if we know that the quadratic term is always negative for every delta x except the zero vector, then we are going to have something like this. So what we want to know, and this is where we're going to be going next time, we're going to want to know We want to know whether uh, for all, in fact, let's write this here. We want to know whether for all delta x, not the zero vector, is it the case that uh, Delta x a delta x is always positive? If it is, we say that this pure quadratic term, the quadratic form, is positive definite. If this is always negative, we say that it is negative definite. And you can see that having it always be positive, uh, so that we have a positive definite quadratic term, quadratic form for any delta x, not the zero vector, uh, then intuitively it's clear that we're going to actually have a minimum. And if indeed this quadratic term, this quadratic form, is negative definite, then it's clear intuitively that x bar is going to be a maximum of at least our approximating function, and therefore going to be a maximum of the actual function f. And uh, it turns out that if it's always greater than or equal to 0, we say that's positive semi-definite. And if this is less than or equal to 0, we say this is negative 
semi-definite. And uh, that will be something that has to be true uh, as a consequence, as an implication, when we have uh, a positive, when we have a maximum or a minimum. One of these two is going to have to be true. Um, and I guess one more point we might make is that with these pure quadratic terms, with the quadratic form, it also seems as if the quadratic form as a function is going to be strictly concave in the case where we have a negative definite quadratic form. And it seems as if it's going to be strictly convex when we have a positive definite quadratic form. And perhaps concave or convex, weakly, not strictly, when we have a semi-definite quadratic form. So this ties together optimization quadratic forms, Taylor approximating polynomials, and uh, concave and convex and quasi-con, uh, and strictly concave and strictly convex functions. So a lot of the things we've been doing are going to be getting tied together when we next, uh, when we go to our next lecture, which is going to be on quadratic forms. And so that's it for today. See you next time.